this is, this is, this is. Welcome to a brand new episode of the My Career Podcast. Great episode for you. Before we get there, mxpx.com. We have tickets available for Atlanta, March 15th at the Buckhead Theater. And then the next night in Orlando, March 16th, Saturday night, Orlando House of Blues. MXPX and the Ataris coming your way down south. Going to be fun. Going to be tons of energy. Come on out. Let's go. A uh, bunch of people are going to be there already, of course, but there are tickets available at mxpeaks.com. Uh, and also new merch. And if you haven't already done so, check out the new album, Find a Way Home. We're, we're supporting that album on this tour and playing a bunch of new songs, and we're switching up the new songs that we play here and there. But uh, having a blast with that. Adding in, of course, all our, the MXPX classic songs from back in the day um, and updating the set list. Always, always new set lists, always trying to make it fresh. So come on out and see us, mxpeaks.com. Love all y'all. Um, thanks for listening to the podcast as well. This episode is, uh, it's a little bit of uh, something different, but it's in the vein of music. Chad Shepard is a murderabilia dealer. He deals in oddities, in mummified things, in body parts, in, in serial killer memorabilia, things like that. And he also grew up touring and playing bass in bands and, and, and being a tour manager and doing the whole punk rock touring thing growing up through his uh, younger adult years. And that really prepared him for what you're going to hear. Um, a lot of crazy stories. If you're squeamish, don't listen to this. It's not, it's not terrible. I mean, honestly, like uh, it, it's fairly, it's fairly tame as far as these things can be, but it is adult subjects it's um mostly horrific stuff but um yeah you might want to just not have your kids listening if you're if you have young kids anyway that being said uh if you want to be part of the podcast please call in 360-830-6660 leave a voicemail maybe you have a question a comment an idea something you want me to to talk about to, to express to you um i love doing those episodes so call in if you want to be part of New Music Mondays or just Music Mondays, you go to the My Career Podcast Facebook group and you submit a YouTube video on the wall there and that'll get added to the list. And I do those Music Mondays now and again. And we just had one uh, a couple weeks ago. It was great. Here's my guest, Chad Shepard. So you're in Nashville? Yes, I'm, I'm close to the Nashville area. I'm about 20 minutes outside of Nashville in Cedar Hill, Tennessee. Okay. So out, in the, out in the sticks. How long you been out there? Oh man, I've been out here off and on since 2015. Um, like at one time, I had a, we had a place in Georgia and up here because we were working with a bunch of different entertainers and artists. Um, but I've been living full time here since the last two or three years. Right on, right on. So, you know, I, I got into a little bit of what you do. You're a you're a murder abelia dealer, which yeah, that's, yeah, a lot. Not a lot of people maybe know what that is, but. It kind of makes sense, memorabilia, murderabilia. Um, I'll, I'll let you go, but but not only that, I love the punk rock and ska sort of thing you bring to to you know you your character. Um, <laughs> so I want to I want to talk not only about you know what you do now, but but yeah. also just how you came up, where you grew up, uh, yeah. how you got into music. I'd love to kind of yeah. get into some of that, but but before we get into the, the that that stuff. What is it that you actually do? Can you t can you tell us? <laughs> yeah, I, do, I do a wide variety of stuff. So me and my wife run a, a company called Offbeat Horror Oddities and Collectibles. Um, we do a lot of events, like we do like Comic Con style events. Uh, we sell murder billia, which is like true crime relics and artifacts. We deal and sell in human remains from like. Uh, when you see you go to a museum and you see a skeleton or a skull or something like that or a shrunken head, all that has to be obtained somehow. So we're kind of like uh, the people doing that as well as selling like uh, horror toys, like, you know, and signatures, autographs, a wide variety of stuff, you know, that pretty much all falls under the same banner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That horror kind of craziness. Um, yeah. So uh, what I kind of like as I was kind of getting – back into some of what you do is you find things for people like like if somebody has like i want you know a human skull or i want yeah. whatever right like you you'll go and find something like 
I'd love to hear some stories about that. Like, what are yeah. some of the weirdest things people are asking for? So one of my favorite things is one of the things I sent you because it was just like such a weird thing. I had a lady. Uh, she's uh, been on, I want to say, Ghost Nation, which is like a TV show. She's been a customer of ours for about probably half a decade. Um, but uh, her wife had reached out and wanted us to find some skeleton hands some like skeletal articulated hands. And in the process, the, I, I reached out to one of my guys. He's like, well, I don't have that currently, but I have a mummified human arm. So oh I said, can you, can you send me some photos of it? So I sent, he sent me some photos. I immediately sent it to her. We immediately bought it and then uh, had it mailed directly to her. And then a couple of days later from or like her birthday or anniversary or something, I got to get the video of her, un, you know, the unveiling of it, you know, she unwrapped it. So for me, that was kind of a cool thing, you know, because I never really found, you know, if you would have told me like 10 years ago that I would have kind of found this lane, you know, I would have, well, that's kind of wild, but that's kind of cool, you know. Um, so, so I've been able to do that, like uh, been able to help like, you know, different, a variety of people. And that's what a lot of people assume in this lane that everybody looks like, you know, we do, you know, yeah. people like this, but I've got people in law enforcement that like are in pushing their sixties, you know, I've got, uh, older ladies, you know, it's a wide variety of people that are into just odd, weird things, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah. It's like when you see, when you see like a grandma with a, you know, a, a body part, just chilling, <laughs> happy, like it's, it's weird. It's like a juxtaposition you're not used to thinking yeah. about. Right. Yeah. And, and that that kind of goes through my mind when I see uh, elderly people that are fully tattooed. Like a lot yeah. of us in our generation are going to be elderly and yeah. we're going to be fully tattooed. And yeah. it's just a trip to see. But like, it's like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Eventually you, you get old and these sailors were in the, you know, the 1940s or whatever and just got totally covered. But anyway, back to back to like the different people that, that ask for things. There was there were some TV shows a while back um and I'm not up on TV today, so maybe they're still around. But there was American Pickers, which I loved. It, which I was just, love that show. Bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just loved just getting to see. You know, you just getting to watch them on the road driving around. There's yeah. like a romanticism to that. You know, the, the American back roads, and I, I picture kind of what you have to do to be similar to that in a in a more morbid way. But you know, yeah. you have to dig through old remnants of broken down things and houses like so i mean have you done that on the road like with your you were touring with your ska band so like yeah yeah so like yeah so uh we've toured we've done a lot of so i was uh i've been in bands throughout the years but yeah when we would tour with bands and it got to where a lot of times we were just tour managers you know or agents or bus driver or whatever that have you so when the show would end at two or three in the night me and my wife would dip out to some kind of true crime spot to collect a relic you know mm. in person then uh, we actually developed a show, you know, where we've directed, uh, self-funded, um, filmed it. You know, we're the cinematographers and it's being pitched currently to a bunch of streaming. We've been on calls like uh, we had several calls of Blumhouse. They they eventually rejected the idea. But just the fact that we had them even look at our stuff was super cool. But it's like that. I always tell people it's like an American pickers of the macabre, you know, mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, we went to some crazy spots. And a lot of times these spots are in, you know, uh, very bad neighborhoods. So you've got that danger element when you're at like 3.30 in the morning mm -hmm. going to a neighborhood to collect some kind of artifact from the location uh, for a buyer. So, yeah, we've done a lot of traveling. And uh, it's just something I really enjoy, man. You know, I really enjoy it. And even like all my friends, like even when I was touring with that, they were kind of like a horror ska band. They were called the Independents. Um, uh, they were managed by Joey Ramon for a number of years. I ended up doing about 150 shows, play, filling in as a bass player for them. Um, but even those guys who are into the horror element, when you talk about these other things, that was even taboo for a lot of these guys. You know, that's like, all right, that's going a little too far. You know, so yeah, there is a, there is like this obsession with true crime in America, <laughs> and it was really really big. You know, a few years ago, it's still big now, but. There's all these different shows that have happened, and I, I admit I've I've watched plenty. I've watched my fair share um, yeah. of of shows, and uh, I'm trying to think of the one that was um, on Netflix that was like the beginning of the FBI, and the you probably have watched it. It was like murder. It was like Mind Hunter. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, and, and I really enjoyed that show. And, and I can imagine. Okay, if there if there was like 
10 seasons of that show, uh. you could become a real connoisseur of serial killer killers, yeah. the, you know, the way they, you know, reading books and, and, you know, just get really sucked into it much like you kind of are a little bit, right? Like a little bit. Yeah. Right. So yeah. what, what is it something that you just, you don't choose, right? You don't choose. You just kind of are drawn to it. What, what is the, what's the yeah. fandom of that? Like, so I like? think, well, for one, just to like put this out there right off the rip, like I don't idolize these guys. Like, I don't think they're, you know, cool by any means. I, it, to me, it's more about trying the understanding of someone's mind and where they're at and what drive. Cause that's not a normal thing, right? It's not a yeah. normal thing. It's serial killer. Um, but I think it's, I think it's been like that, you know, since I was a kid, I mean, being early on as a kid, I remember, you know, uh, when the Dahmer thing was all over the news and it was just intriguing because it's so out of the norm and so wild, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and people have been into that stuff since the beginning of, the of time. You know, we have museums for everything from uh, swords of kings who slayed other kings, you know, mm -hmm. people have been into this thing. I think it's a, for me, you know, I have four kids, so like I, I for me, it's kind of like making myself and others that I care about around me to know that there is evil in the world and that there really people like this do exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that you know I can uh, acquire these items that I would say of kind of a piece of dark history um, for the purpose of other people kind of learning about them, um, you know, I just. It's just something that's always intrigued me, you know, and I've always uh, found to be fascinating. Yeah. It's kind of similar to like going to the zoo. You know, you go yeah. to the zoo, you, you're behind this glass and you see a tiger and yeah. you're just like, that thing would rip me apart if yeah. we were, this glass wasn't right here. And yeah. it seems like a similar thing, you know, you're scared, to, but you want to know kind of what happened and, and what's going on here. And it's, it's yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of human instinct involved in in the history and what we sort of like the stories we tell, yeah, you know, and, and bring down to our children. You know, the boogeyman. You know, that's that. Those are stories for a reason because there were real boogeymen. I, I was, I I'm not too squeamish, but at the same time, like I was listening to this podcast, and now it's been years and years. But uh, my buddy Moon, Phil Moon, uh, he. He uh, told me, listen to this podcast, it's great. And it was, like, all about serial killers. And it was it was cool, but, like, I listened to, like, the second episode, and and, and it was all about children. And this guy was just getting – I couldn't do it after that. It was just, like, okay, that cured me of whatever I was trying to, like, find out. But, but at the same time, I'm not squirmish. I grew up watching – I've seen plenty of horror movies. I've, I've, you know, I feel like I've seen – I haven't seen a real dead body in person, though. So yeah. – so, it's there's a line that gets crossed maybe in in your psyche when you see I've seen pictures I've seen videos for sure you can be on Instagram and see people die yeah it's just wild kind of wild you can't see a tit yeah but you can see yeah if, if they you put a titty out there they're gonna flag it yeah. and now but you can see like violence you violence. Know? yeah yeah so well, it's, so it's yeah it, it is it's like something that like is so absolutely like terrifying yeah you know it's people that have no real psychopaths basically don't have any fear of repercussion one either maybe they don't think they're going to get caught ever or they don't think if they get caught they're really going to go to prison or whatever it is right that yeah. i've heard a lot of stories about the these psychopaths that have just wreaked havoc on the public and yeah. they they honestly are surprised a lot of times when they get caught i think the movies uh, probably use certain types of serial killers because they're more interesting. So, like, the, the serial killer that's super cerebral, plans everything out, like, there's got to be... Is there another type of serial killer that we don't know about? I guess my question is, the movies, is that completely kind of what you found in, in the stories, or is there other types of of weirdos and serial killers out there? Yeah, I mean, there's there's there is a wide variety. You have people that, and this is like I don't I don't claim to be an expert on it at all. You know, this is sure. more of someone who's interested. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, like I don't want to be quoted on like uh, sometimes I might get the facts a little jumbled. But sure. as far as my personal opinion goes, like you have those people that do it because they have a need inside of them. 
to fulfill something, like they get some kind of enjoyment. And then you have people that do it for, for financial gain. You know, there, there's been uh, female serial killers that, you know, have uh, killed for, you know, uh, multiple times to gain insurance policies. You know, so, yeah, there's a wide, you know, there's several varieties of, of people that do that, you know. Um, the money thing you could almost understand, not that it's a yeah. good thing, but like yeah. you could get, okay, I could, I could jump to that bridge and be like, okay, I get it. Yeah. But yeah, the, the need inside, that's something that, wow, you know, it, it, it must be what anything feels like, you know, when you, you have to, but it, this just happens to be killing people. Like, so like I have a need to play punk rock music and sing and write songs, you know, and, and encourage people. And some people have a need to just murder and kill yeah. and, and terrorize like, um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like Tains Chainsaw, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that movie, you know, uh -huh. I watched that fairly young and that was absolutely terrifying. That's like the pinnacle for me of like what would be terrifying. But then again, yeah. it's like, there's so much out there that, that real, you, can, you know? Yeah. That's actually real yeah. and happening. And that movie was loosely based on like the story of Ed Gein, you know, mm -hmm. and because of that movie, being in bands like you have been and I've been when you travel, anytime you're in the countryside, somebody in the bands that takes a chase all massacre, you know, yep. you're, just, like, you're just waiting for some cop to pull you over. And, yep. it's, and it's like, uh oh, this this is the wrong cop. This is the wrong uh, one. Like, <laughs> uh, really, it really did mess with you for those small country towns like you. You don't trust the cops, you know, because they were the ones in the movie that kind of lured you to your demise, you yeah. know? So Everybody's in on it. It's the conspiracy yeah. thing. Yeah. percent. Well, um, so, so that's pretty, I mean, it, I, I could see how it would be pretty fun to just tour around the, the country, pick yeah. up things. Um, as far as the business goes, like, are you just a business guy? Do you run a, a what were you doing before you started this business? I mean, you've been tour <laughs> managing, you've been kind of taking yeah. care of bands and artists. Yeah. So like literally since I was 13, I've been playing music and, and literally there was a local band from, I was from Dothan, Alabama originally. Um, I actually oh. saw you in 96 at Dothan high school. I've got a pretty funny story about that too. But at that time, you know, like I grew up in like a Christian home, so I wasn't really allowed to listen to anything secular. So I had to go and find things that my parents would approve of because they would read all the lyrics and stuff. So uh, I remember the first time I went to like the local Christian bookstore and they had like a tooth and nail section, you know, and I, and I ended up buying like a, I think it was like teenage politics. Mm -hmm. I ended up, shortly after like the spud gun album 90 pound was uh you know all those albums are hugely inf influential with me as far and even zayo like zayo still to this day one of my favorite uh favorite bands um so that was kind of my introduction into it can i just say that's a little <laughs> ironic given what you do now and your parents didn't let you listen to secular music yeah what 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 were they what were they worried about obviously because <laughs> <laughs> I got through that. Yeah, they probably, that you, yeah, you sell dead body parts, but uh, hey, the yeah. music thing was a was a real good choice, parents. <laughs> yeah, I used to have to take like my Misfits Earth AD album, and I would put it in my little pop up CD player, and then put like a Christian album on top. Yeah, because my dad would go behind, or my parents would go and say, "Okay, make sure I was listening to the right stuff," you know. Yeah. Oh, Michael W. Smith again. All right. Okay, Chad. All right. Oh, I definitely had to listen to some Michael W. Smith. I was definitely. <laughs> Force fed some DC talk at one point. You know? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, all those things, but that was kind of my introduction into it. Then I started going to local shows at like thirteen or fourteen. Um, I started playing, and I guess I was in a band for about a decade called the Lightweights. We were a really shitty punk band. We were, you know, pretty much a rip off of all the uh, pop punk tooth and nail bands like you guys and all the other ones. You know, it was really bad. But that was my introduction. Um, from there, I end up joining the military station in uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia, Columbus, Georgia. And then I started playing with some guys in kind of a horror punk band. And that was kind of like the first band I saw that are that I'd been a part of that people actually came to the shows. You know, I'd have like 40 or 50 people. We could travel like a, several hours out of our hometown, have some people come out. So you, um, you said you were in you joined the army. Yeah, I was I was in the army. I was uh, infantry soldier. I was stationed at Fort Benning. I was in for uh, 
2000 to 2003. Um, it really, you know, like, I, you know, I'm glad I did it, you know, uh, but it really wasn't my thing, you know. Were you at, were you kind of gung ho before you went in, or were you kind of just like this is my option because I want to get some training and some financial security? What was the reason to do that? Well, the main reason is I got out of high school and I I, I was a, I worked hard from fourteen up until eighteen. I was working full time, like pretty much fifteen, sixteen years old. Um, so when I got out of high school, I was given like an assistant manager position at a local grocery store, and I worked my butt off for about six months. And then finally I was like, you know what? I'm done. I quit it. And I did nothing, dude. I lived with the band I was playing in. We lived like in a little farmhouse. We ended up losing our electricity and our power. So I was fine. I had lost everything, bro. My parents were helping me out. So I had to do something. And from where I was at, I didn't have many options. So I went and saw a recruiter and it happened so quick, man. It's like a couple months later, I'm in basic training, you know, um, and then, you know, shortly got in, you know, and after being in for a while, I was like, you know, like, you know, I'm glad this got me out of town, but this just wasn't my cup of tea. You know, yeah. I come from a punk rock background. I didn't want to, I want to be able to tell someone to, you know, I want to do my own thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, yeah. I could only imagine. I could only imagine that's, you have to put a, put aside your feelings for a few, for, yeah. for a while and really kind of, cause it must be torture if you don't mentally except, Hey, I'm here. I got to train. I got to do what they say. I yeah. got to get up on, uh, when they say and eat when they say, and that's just kind of my life for a while. I mean, it, maybe that's the best case scenario. If you can actually do that, maybe not everybody can get through that right M mentally or whatever, especially nowadays, it must be harder with the, the attention spans. And we didn't have cell phones back then. Like we no. weren't like, oh, I'm going to put Twitter down or whatever. Like no. it was, I didn't care. So I could have done it then i think but yeah. i just think how how much harder it would be now now that cell phones are or, you know smartphones are, are consuming our yeah. lives you know in a, in a lot of ways but that's wild I, I love hearing about that okay so you're in the army yeah not your thing um but you go through it 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 must have had some effect on you some work ethic gets, oh, for, you know yeah. i mean you're already working you were saying when you're young yeah um taking care of yourself from an early age yeah, so for so from from there, like I just pretty much uh, got out. I was playing in a band um, at the time called Ashes of October. It's a horror punk band. And we we pretty much toured whenever we could um, uh, until that band finally kind of met its demise. Never really did a whole lot of that. So f for the next probably five or ten years, I just played in bands. You know, mm -hmm. um, I ended up playing in a. I guess the one I had the most success with was this band called Two Thirteen. Uh, which was another kind of, it was like, black, I called it black and punk. It was like a, a kind of a mix of like black metal and punk rock with a lot of like horror movie and kind of serial killer references. And uh, you know, we did some shows like we were able to play with the Misfits, um, uh, like uh, Steve Zing's band. Like we did a lot of like, we had a lot of opportunities. We're in several magazines. Um, but then ultimately my best friend and the singer of the band ended up passing away. Um, so when that happened, that kind of like that like threw my whole world for a loop, you know. Yeah. Because I've always enjoyed writing music and stuff. So I, from that, kind of went through. I was going through relationship after relationship. You know, I've got four kids and three babies, mom, baby mamas. So you know, my, my life is like an episode of Jerry Springer. So <laughs> I knew I had something. So I got to get something stable that I can make some money at, um, and, you know, and take care of myself. So that was kind of like, uh, I, I just met my current wife. We've been together for 10 years. Um, I needed to get out of town because that town was just bad news for me. It's where my buddy passed away. Just a lot of bad memory, uh, bad things. So it was kind of like throwing a dart at the map. And, uh, we decided on Nashville. I answered a Craigslist ad from this guy, <laughs> Um, about a booking agent thing. And I was like, well, I can do a booking agent. I've been booking shows for for a long time. Like, I literally, at that point, probably booked a 1,000 shows for a bunch of bands. Had little DIY venues. So I called the guy up. He told me to come out there. He wanted to meet with me. Um, so I went to Music Row, met with this guy. I kind of had this impression just by the way of talking that I was going to get there, and he'd be like, well, I kind of used car salesman with a cigar. Like, I want to make you a star. Yeah. <laughs> I went and met with him. He gave me a chance. Uh, a few months later, I was like helping tour managers for this artist named Bubba Sparks. You know, mm -hmm. um, he, he had a bunch of hits back in the day. 
uh, I got introduced to this thing called country rap, which I didn't even know existed, you know, um, and then started kind of meeting these other artists and just all kind of went from there. I used the background because I came from uh, in music, punk rock, you've got to hustle. If you're in a tour and punk band that's not selling a lot of tickets, you're at the gas station selling shirts and CDs out of the trunk of the car. You know, you're doing whatever you can, picking up an acoustic guitar, playing a song at an open mic with a tip jar. Hey, we're trying to get the next city. So I took that same work ethic and applied it to that, and it was just, I was crushing it. You know, everybody had never seen that kind of work ethic. And uh, it went a year later, me and my wife were able to buy the company I started working for. Um, so we bought it, and then we had one artist that just started blowing up. He went from playing for 100 to 500, and the last shows we did were two sold out, you know, all arena shows that were selling out. Um so it just kind of started from there, you know, just kind of got the entertainment thing. Uh, and then whenever we ultimately ended up getting laid off a couple of years ago, and we had spent 10 years devoting every waking hour to other people, we're like, okay, uh, we need to do something for ourselves. So at that point, we went to film school because we had done all these music videos. Like we've helped with a music video with Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, we worked with uh, Trey Cyrus of Metro Station. We managed him for a period of time. And what I noticed is that the videographer, the cinematographer, got all the credit. It didn't matter if you secured the set, if you built the set, if you got the, the people to come in. At the end of the day, the guy holding the camera that made the band look good got all the credit. So I was like, well, you know, screw that. We're going to learn how to use this damn camera and start getting some credit. So that's kind of what we did. We went to the film school, learned how to use a camera. We've been doing like little uh, punk videos for local bands and developing our show, which is our ultimate goal is just invest goal is investing in ourselves uh with this show we're trying to put out and uh and that's pretty much you know where i'm at today man man that sounds inspiring man i love it i love that you went to film school and you're like yeah let's hold the camera let's figure this out <laughs> just do it yourself yeah. um so to wrap up a couple things one yeah. do you know what you want done with your body when you die when you pass is there anything yeah. different or you just go go cremation so, like, you know, I've got asked this question because we did do a soft white underbelly interview. And, like, when I went on that, I already knew, like, a lot of people are going to see what we do as, like, a really dark and evil thing, you know. Um, but there were questions in there, like, how would you feel if it was your body? You know, how would you right. feel? And I was like, I'm probably the worst person to ask because, dude, after I die, bro, like, I don't, you know, like, like I think it would be cool if one of my kids had my skull on a mantle or in a case, you know, like ultimately, I think I want to be cremated. My best friend was cremated, and we literally have spread his ashes all over the world. You know, mm. I think that's really cool. So it would be cool if I could, if it were, if you could legally do it, maybe take my skull, give it to someone who cares, cremate a portion of my body, maybe bury a little bit of my body to have like a, a home spot for, for those that care enough that want to come see it. But, uh, are there, you know, has there been celebrities that have, that have, gotten cremated and then sold vials of their ashes to people is that a little too much is that creepy i don't know uh, so so whenever uh charles manson uh died uh his his number one guy got his cremains and they were sold like uh there were several people that got bits of his cremains some people made art pieces out of it um but yeah to answer that question yeah cremains is one of the things that people will absolutely buy you know um, yeah, so there's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. Like, you know, like when we got into, I didn't know that you could obtain these things. I actually bought my first piece of murder billia from Merle Allen of the murder junkies. Um, I had booked his band a couple of times and then I saw on his Facebook, he was selling like, and I was like, holy shit, I didn't even know you could buy stuff like that. So that was the first piece I got. And, and we started off as collectors and then we'd have friends come over and say, Hey, can I buy that? And I was like, huh, you know, so it kind of just started from there, you know? Yeah. No, then it's like, huh. All right. Let's, let's, yeah. it's all yeah. the best things, all the best things, all the best things kind of happen like that where, you know, it's like, it starts out as something that you're already wanting to do. Yeah. And, and like for me with music, like I'm, I'm already writing songs. I might as well continue to just keep it going. Like, let's just, let's go. Let's, uh, let's go around the world. I love it, man. Um, it's it's an interesting life. It's a different kind of thing, you know. But like, like you said, there's just all sorts of people around the world, all kinds of people, and 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 they have their own reasons for why they want certain items and, and things like that, yeah. right? So, 
Yeah, I'm pretty open with almost everything. Like, you know, I as long as it's, I mean, we won't go into all the things I'm not open about, but, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just thinking, yeah, there's there's definitely things that I, I wouldn't be down with. But, but yeah, I'm pretty open just to, like, talk about things, too. So um, I love this conversation, man. Um, I want to I want to see more more from the, the TV show. I know we got to wait a little bit to see if you develop that. Um, yeah. Are there any any kind of things that you guys do on social media that people could check out? Like, where could they find you? Absolutely. And I'll send you, I'll send you a link to watch the pilot episodes too, when you get a chance, like, um, they're not how I per- perceive like the show going because I want to, it to be a non-scripted thing where we just have camera crew follow us. We had to kind of develop it. So there were a lot, and not, not only that, I couldn't really be myself. I was having to make sure the camera was in focus, make sure the audio was tracking. Like, mm-hmm. so I didn't really get a chance, but you can kind of get an outline of it. But um, yeah, so we're, we're definitely online. You can find us at uh, offbeathorror.com. That's offbeat, how it's spelled H O R R O R.com. And there's links to all of our stuff. We've got like a, a convention coming up in Bowling Green, Kentucky at the Corvette Museum. I'm bringing in like the guy who played Pinhead and Hellraiser Judgment. I got Jake the Snake, the old professional wrestler. Bunch of different. Um, I also got a few things. If you got a moment, I'll show you a couple things I laid out to kind of show you. Sure, yeah, let's check it out. Uh, so this is like something, you know, this is a little mummified pig. This is more like one of the oddities things we sell, you know. And as you can tell, the, the guy that did this, he's got add like a little eye in there. You know, we also uh, do like uh, bats, you know, we get a variety of bats and that sort of thing. Um, this is probably one of my favorite pieces. This was given to me by a uh, biker dude as a gift and this is actually made from a human femur bone and a tungsten steel knife blade um which is super cool and then i've got this guy this is just a human skull cat um wow. that sell these at our conventions you know where we can there are certain states we're not able to ship to like there are a few states it's illegal like uh uh georgia uh, pretty much is getting real strict on their human remain uh, laws. Tennessee, if I own a skull in Tennessee, I can sell it. If it was acquired in Tennessee, I can sell it to someone in Tennessee, but I can't ship out of the state. How breakable uh, is something like that, that skull? I actually do. Before we got on here, I actually dropped it, and there's remnants of it on the ground. Oh, wow. But they, they, they're not, like, super – I mean, so it's not like – if you drop it from a, a foot or two, yeah, you're going to have little pieces splinter off. And what will happen sometimes when you get pieces like that, you know, a lot of people will take it and make uh, jewelry out of it and that kind of thing. And, you know, if you break it down into pieces, you can make a lot more money than just selling it as a mm-hmm. kind of thing. Do you know Do you know what that – was that a, a man or a woman's skull from somewhere or, or is it just unknown? This one, this one is unknown. This was actually got, so a lot of the stuff we acquire is like uh, medical specimens. You'll get like uh, the last big lot of stuff we bought. We bought from a guy, his grandfather passed, and he was a, I want to say a dentist. And they went clearing out of stuff, found like this big collection of stuff. And they're like, yeah, we don't want this in our house at all. You know? Yeah. Um, so a lot of times you get stuff like that. Doctors, when when doctors own stuff, it's looked at a lot differently than when somebody with a bunch of tattoos owns it. You know? Yeah. But uh, so a lot of times it's acquired that way, you know, uh, you know, years and years ago during war times, a lot of soldiers brought over trophies from combat and war. So you have some things like that that are still out there that are grandfathered in. Uh, I've owned uh, we've owned and sold a lot of things, but it's a rare occasion. I get the full backstory. You know, it's like yeah. I'll get this who it came from. But that person got it from this person. It's kind of like one of those things or bought it from, you know, there's auctions that go on when, when people pass away and they get rid of things like that. But, um, and then one more thing, Mike, and then I'll, let me grab it real quick. It's on the ground and I'll grab it up. Uh, this guy right here. So we managed this, uh, for a while, this rapper named stitches. He was like, had a bunch of face tattoos. He had a big song called brick in your face that got like millions of views. Um, I think I've heard. Yes. I'm sure. I'm sure I've seen, so there was i was dealing with this other big true crime collector and he was in contact with a serial killer so he sent him a picture of stitches and uh the serial killer did the artwork and then i had there's three of these in existence i own one stitches had one and then the true crime collector and stitches actually signed it on the front and then the signed by the the killer on the back but 
uh, of stitches. But yeah, so we do all kind of stuff like that, you know, like you can go and check us out. We do, and we do a lot of other things, uh, not just, you know, the dark stuff. We, we do some fun things too. So I hope that's cool. What, yeah. Okay. And one little thing I want to tell you, cause I think it's a funny story, dude. When I was like 13 or 14, it was 96. Um, it was at the Dothan High School show. It was you, you guys, because at that time, bro, like everybody in my circle, MXPX was was the band, right? So we all like tried to write songs like that, imitate it, and I and I got to the show, and you were standing out there. One of the guys from Ninety Pound was he was the tallest guy of the bunch, you know, and I was like super nervous to come up and talk, and then I kind of wedge my way in the circle you know kind of listen for a second and i think one of you guys were like hey what's up man and then the only thing i could muster was i got posters of you guys on my wall and then the the guy from 90, 90 pound was like said something back and just like crushed me bro it was like a total crushing you know it's like yeah dude that's real creepy bro you know uh, oh no <laughs> i know but, I don't, well I'll, I'll tell you one thing at that time it, all that was new to us all that like notoriety and <laughs> people coming to sh see shows it was like wow you know you know we didn't know how to to react to people um being fans and having our posters so yeah i, I think we probably didn't say much but um those 90 pound wuss guys never never a dull moment with them hey dude i still got i got their record back here i got the yellow vinyl on the original pressings dude. Love it. that's great i love that record um yeah and if you guys anytime you guys are in nashville you need some cinema cinematographers to make some reels that kind of thing dude just holler at me bro i got you um right yeah. on right on dude thank you so much man thanks for your time i appreciate it it's good to get to know you we'll definitely hang yeah. out in you know yeah. in person we'll make yeah. it happen it'll be cool i'd love to i'd love to use a, like a, we're using a bunch of zayo songs off of crimson corridor for our episodes but um i'd love to talk to you about maybe throwing a couple mxpx songs and when you finally get that deal and push it forward you know okay. for back tracks and stuff Let's do it. Ring it up. Right, Let's brother. go. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Chad Shepard, Offbeat Horror, right? Yeah, Offbeat Horror. Cool. All right, we did it. Thank you so much for checking that out. Um, Chad Shepard, appreciate your time. Thank you for the insight. Thanks for being so open about it. Um, I, I really enjoyed this episode. I used to watch those American Pickers episodes of, of these guys just cruising around America finding oddities, finding old things that have value. And this is just a little bit more of that with the macabre, uh, as you heard. But um, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, you know, there's a market out there for everyone. So, Chad, I, I appreciate you and, and wish you the best. Um, hope hope the show goes well, and I hope, um, hope they pick it up. Um, add, us to the, add us to the soundtrack, bro. All right. Um, mxpeaks.com we've got some shows coming up atlanta georgia march 15th at buckhead theater and then march 16th orlando house of blues orlando florida florida let's go um all our friends are coming out it's gonna be great and um we'll, we'll go from there um we have april 5th in denver sold out april 6th in salt lake city sold out thank you um and we'll have by by now I might be blowing this out outro and there's some shows that I need to tell you about. But for now, we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, check back. Make sure you follow us online and uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Peace.